to still count from 100, so it's your benefit anyway. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are at Lecture 7 in Math 131. Tomorrow is Big Test Day, Test 1. Test 1 is going to cover difference equations from your supplement, Chapter 10, Sections 1, 2, 3, and 4. Be sure you bring your calculator. Your test is generally part no calculator. You turn that in and then you get your calculator part. For this particular group, your test for sure is definitely that tomorrow. Uh, then it's going to cover textbook sections 1.1 through 1.7. Um, I'm actually behind the quote schedule of the department, um, so we're cutting it off at 1.7. Then we're going to, after our, we finish our little review today, we're going to try to get back on track, so we're going to start new material. And actually, 1.8, I've already tried to put a little bit in your minds, and the book did too, when we talked about cost versus marginal cost. What do you remember marginal cost was? Yeah, it's the derivative, which is the slope, and that tells you the extra cost to produce one more item. Well, derivatives as a rate of change comes back and uh, gets that topic again with revenue, profit, um, some other topics that when you have a function and you look at the derivative, that tells you what it's going to be, one more item, one more day, one more whatever. Okay, and then 2, 1, we've already described graphs with difference equations, uh, increasing, decreasing, monotonic, um, constant, whatever. A uh, few more descriptions in words. That's section 2.1. And then 2.2 says, well, how do we apply the derivative for curve sketching? So we're going to see our first application of derivatives, one of our first applications of derivatives, which is curve sketching, which leads to the big important topic in this course is how do you optimize situations? Like what size box do you need that holds a certain amount? Um, well, and uses maybe not optimize, but um, minimize, like, and you use the least amount of materials. Okay, your box has to hold so much, and you want to use the least amount of materials to build your box. Or uh, you probably saw in pre-calculus when you uh, had some fencing, what would be the dimensions of your little garden area so that you have the maximum garden size. That was a little flavor getting into this, and those always worked out to be quadratic equations. But now that you're going to have the derivative, you're going to learn how to be, you'll learn how to take all kinds of equations and find the maximum value or the minimum value, like maximizing area, maximizing volume, minimizing um, surface area, which would be materials. Or if you're running a business with inventory, you want to minimize your inventory cost. So how many objects should you purchase and store? So we'll be looking at lots of applications. But before you do that, you have an opportunity to see how the derivative affects the graph so you can see the maximum values and the minimum values. So once you get your functions with the word problems, it all comes together. Alrighty, so we're going to um, go through the book and do a little bit of reviewing for the test tomorrow, and we're going in reverse order since you've had more opportunities to ask questions already uh, on difference equations and the first textbook sections. So, if you'll have your book with me, and I've picked out a few selected problems, but I'm also taking questions from you. Uh, be sure you know what your questions are when you, what it is you don't understand. Okay, in chapter uh, 1.7, let's just sort of turn the pages a second. 1.7 is, um, it first wanted to point out to you that all the functions don't have to be y equals. For example, here, your function is t cubed, so you're taking the derivative where your independent variable is t. So I'm taking the derivative of t cubed with respect to t, and you've got your 3t squared. Um, let's see, also in this chapter, example two is asking you to find second derivatives. And to find a second derivative, you have to take a first derivative, and then you take a derivative of your first derivative to get your second derivative, correct? Mm -hmm. And you can continue on as long as there's a derivative there, 
but you will not be applying that in other classes. Yes? When do you do that thing where you, um, you take the derivative and then you put the derivative of the, of the area in parentheses? You know what I'm talking about? General power rule. That's it. Oh, general power rule. I just wanted to know what it was called. General power rule. That will be um, section 1.6. Hold your question. Okay. Um, middle of page 120. Here's your various forms for your derivative. First derivatives and second derivatives. Okay, and then example three on the top of page 121. Please use your, use your book a lot. I mean, you paid a lot of money for it. It's pretty good with examples. You might write down example three, cover, cover it up. And they're looking for, if you look at this part right here, what are they asking you to do? Find the derivative and plug in three. Is it the first derivative? Second. Second, derivative. second derivative. So you take your function, you take your first derivative, take your second derivative, and then substitute in three. You're evaluating the second derivative at three. Then look underneath, and they're really good at putting in step by step. So there's your first derivative, second derivative. And remember, this little line means evaluate at x equal to 3. So you put your 3 into your second derivative. Your book's pretty good at this. Another notation you might would have used for this same question. What would be another notation you might use for the same question? Y double prime. Uh, y double prime is, uh, is acceptable. It's not the best. What's another? F double prime. Okay, knowing that you're calling your function f, you could do a f double prime at 3. That would be the same thing as this question right here. The disadvantage of just doing a y double prime is once you start getting into functions of more than one variable. Okay, I mean, we do this all the time, but next semester you'll be doing y equals things in x's and z's and t's, and so you'll do partial derivatives. Okay. Uh, down at the bottom of page 121, it starts talking about marginal concepts. And we had a problem earlier where we did a cost function. We got the marginal cost, and you could use that marginal cost to approximate the next value of the function. Uh, right here, let's see if we have it in here somewhere. I think they're telling you right here. Um, where did they put the, okay, it's the next page, page 122, page 122, where you have the additional cost. <coughs> it's saying that the derivative at A is pretty much the difference between the cost, say, at 2 and the cost at 3. That's that up and over. The derivatives is the cost of the additional item. So then when you look at marginal cost, marginal cost, we really thought of it more as the cost of the next item is approximately equal to, I'm just solving this little equation right here anyway, is approximately equal to the cost of A items plus the derivative at A. Because we started at the cost at A, we took the derivative and went up and over, and that was approximately the cost of the next item. Okay, so we sort of looked at it more in this direction. All right, um, bottom of page 22, marginal cost. Suppose that the cost function is this. Daily production is 50 items. What is the extra cost in increasing the daily production from 50 to 51 items? The extra cost. Well, the real extra cost would be the difference between the cost at 51 and 50. I mean, that's the extra cost. When it asks for marginal cost, that's where you're using an approximation because you've got a curve, not a straight line. And when you use marginal cost, you're really using that tangent line to approximate. So what is the marginal cost at 50? When you take that derivative at 50, you get 15.5. So that's a, an approximation. It's close to the actual cost close to the actual cost. Back in part A, the actual cost is 15.7555. That would be the real cost, subtracting C at 51 minus C at 50. Marginal cost came off the tangent line, and it's 15.5. So you're not that far off, okay, from the real cost. It's called tangent line approximations. 
And then uh, marginal revenue, marginal profit, the same idea, the extra profit you get from the production and sale of one more item. What's the difference between the words profit and revenue? Okay, revenue is what you have as a whole, meaning that's how much money you take in from the sale of your items. Revenue, is that what I said? And profit is take your revenue and what are you going to pull off? Total. Your cost, and then that tells you what your profit is. Okay, all right. So the exercise is in 1.7. I'm on page 124. I wanted to look at a couple problems out of here to make sure we're good, but let's just um, pick one. How about problem number six? I want you to find the first derivative, and I want you to use proper notation. First derivative and use proper notation. X equals 16t squared plus 45t plus 10. Okay, it says x equals 16t squared plus 45t plus 10. What would be your proper notation here? D what? That's it. I'm taking the derivative of this. Mm -hmm, this would be I'm taking the derivative of x with respect to t because my variable is t here. Um, that would be the notation. Of course, you could always go, I'm taking the derivative of 16t squared plus 45t plus 10 <coughs> over dt. But your dependent variable here is x and your independent is t. So your answer is what, everybody? 32t, 32T plus 45. Okay. All right, let's look at problem number um, 25. 25. What is this asking you to do? Second derivative. Take the second derivative, so you'll take the first derivative, then you take the second derivative, and then do you quit? Uh, no. No, then evaluate. what do you do? Evaluate, it. evaluate it too. So you have to do your first derivative, then take the derivative of that for your second derivative, and then substitute in 2. All right, I haven't gotten to the problems I want to do yet. We're still just looking through. All right, problem number um, 26 looks a little different. I don't think I've mentioned this notation to you. Problem number 26. Anybody have a clue what that says? The double derivative. It is. Good. The notation is a little different, but remember how you always start working inside parentheses first? So it first says take the derivative of y with respect to x, then take that derivative again, and then evaluate. So that really is more notation for second derivative evaluated at x. One. Okay. One. Sorry. X equal one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you take the second derivative of the part to the right and yeah. then you Wait. evaluate with one. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You just you do your first derivative, which is three x squared plus two. Second derivative is what, six x? Yeah. And then put a one in it, so you should get about a six. Okay, everybody good on that notation? All right, the next example I wanted us to look at was number 37. 37, I'll move it over. Let C of X be the cost in dollars of manufacturing X bicycles per day in a certain factory. And we're going to do some interpreting. We want to know what C at 50 equals 5,000 means and C prime at 50 equals 45. Now, personally, when I'm going to do some interpretation or try to understand, I'm a visual person, so I like to pretend I have a little graph. All right, has everybody got the question number 37 on page 125? All right. So if I were going to draw this, what would I have along my x-axis? 
X, right? X bicycles per day. And what would I have along my Y axis? C, which is cost in dollars. Mm -hmm. It's the cost in dollars to manufacture bicycles per day. All right. And one thing that I know is C of 50 equals 5,000. What did that just give me relative to my graph? The S and Say it again. X and y. It gave me a point, right? When X is 50, the Y value is 5,000. So I've got a point out here of 50, 5,000. All right. The X corresponds to the bicycles per day. The 5,000 is the cost, right? Okay, so if you've got it set up so that you know what it is, this is the cost in dollars of manuf let's get the rest of the story, manufacturing X bicycles. All right, somebody make a complete statement. Well, why don't you tell your neighbor first? Make a complete, I always put these on test anyway, interpret. Interpret C at 50 equals 5,000 relative to this problem. Okay, you said it great. Say it for me. Okay, the cost of manufacturing 50 bicycles is $5,000. Pretty easy, huh? Okay, now the next thing it gave us was that the derivative at 50 is 45. The derivative at 50 is 45. Where is that on my graph? Help me out here. Tangent line. Okay. Point. All right. It has something to do with the tangent line. What does this give me relative to the tangent line? Point. Slope. Slope. This is the slope of tangent line. All right. So you would go up 45 and over one, right? Slope, rise, over, run. All right, now let's put units with it. Going up 45 is going to be a change in what? Cost. Cost. And X is change, oh, sorry. One, <laughs> one is change in X, number of bicycles per day. All right, so when you are at this point, we don't know what the real curve looks like. I mean, they didn't give us a, an equation for a real curve. The curve might go something like this, or it might be going up like this. But this is going to be using the slope of the tangent line to approximate the next value. All right, so tell your neighbor a good statement about this relative to this. The words on the test are interpret relative to the problem. Okay, tell your neighbor. One more. All right. Who wants to tell me? Second row. Somebody tell me. Second row. Make one more bike. It's about forty-five more dollars. When? What? When will that be the case? Because <laughs> is it 50. in the beginning? Is it down the road? When is it going to cost after you about you forty-five dollars? When you are already producing fifty bicycles after per that, day. It's only forty-five per bike. Right. When you're already producing fifty bicycles per day, to increase your production by one more bike that day to the next day is going to cost you about forty-five dollars. I mean, if, if every bicycle cost a total of $45, it would be a straight line, and every single bike would cost $45. But usually a cost function uh, is not a straight line because um, it's going to have some kind of curve, and then it'll level off because you already got all your parts or something, and then if you start getting your production, I'm going the wrong way. Usually it costs a lot to get started in a business for production, but once you get going, it usually levels off in the cost per item till all of a sudden you've stretched your employees too thin, your buildings are too small, and then it's going to cost more if you try to keep producing. So you don't usually have a straight line for a cost function. Doesn't that make sense? So is it only 45 on the 51st bike, or is it 51st yeah. from then on? Uh, from the 51st it's, to a certain it, number. It can only be maybe like the next 10 bikes are only 45 for that. 
And it just it's goes just back to way too expensive because it'd be like overtime for all your people that are working for you. Okay. I appreciate you answering that because, and you asking that question because you're pretty close to the right answer. What this is going <laughs> to give close. you, one little thing I would well, edit. Right on the money. <laughs> well, you're pretty close. What this did was it gave you a tangent line to the curve. Okay, a tangent line to the curve. The real cost is on the red line. The approximate cost is on the green line. So we know it really costs about $45 to produce the ne next bite when you're already at 50, or about $45 less if you produced only $49. But the further you get away from that point, because see this thing right here could come on down, your tangent line could just keep going way on up, and if you keep going up 45, you're estimating the cost to be too high. So in reality, it's very close to where you are. The further you get away, the bigger the difference is in the true value. But it's a lot cheaper than $100 per bite. What? Cheaper than $100 for a yeah, bite? Yeah, whenever you build the first 50, they're $100 per bite. Th well, yeah, you can look at it that way, but actually it might have been the first bikes cost $300 and the real curve started leveling off. It's not a straight line. It's not that every bike was $100 in the beginning. The first ones might have cost more than, the first 10 may have cost a whole lot more than the next 10. Right. Okay. But good thinking, and yes, that you could think that. All right. Based on this information right here, will somebody approximate what you think C of 51 is? You probably think that's a trick question. What is it? 5045 because if it's 5000 to do 50 it's about $45 to do another one so C at 51 is about 5045 do we know that's exactly what the cost is no because we don't really know the equation for the red curve can you approximate what you think C of 49 is Yes, yeah, the 5,000 minus the 45, whatever that is, 465? Nine. <laughs> 4965? Yeah. 35. Five five. Five five. Five five. Aren't we thankful for calculators? <coughs> okay, 4955. Five. All right, everybody good? Okay. Um, next problem I wanted to look at was problem number 40 on page 125. Problem number 40. Okay, let P of X be the profit of producing and selling X units of good. So what is along the Y axis? Y axis. Profit, and along the X axis is number of units of goods, X. All right, now here you have some questions, A, B, C, and D. And solutions, oops, let me go a little further down. Solutions are a little A, B, C, and D. This problem is an exercise in translating the words to symbols. Translating the words to symbols. All right, take about 30 seconds with your neighbor and have fun. How are we doing, everybody? Good? <laughs> All right, let's see if, if we can um, go through this. Are we on the screen? We are. Okay, so along the y-axis you have the profit 
and x-axis is units of goods. Alrighty. So the first question is, what is the profit? What is the profit? Which one of these is profit? The y-axis, right? What is the profit from producing 1,000 units of goods? The 1,000 goes with the x. So which of these is going to give me y when x is 1,000? Which one? P of x. x is 1,000, right? So D goes with A. How many got that right? Made me feel good. Okay, well, lie if you have to. All right. Let's jump to problem part D question, and then we'll go back and do B and C. For what level of production? Level of production. So what am I looking for, level of production? How many? Yeah, X units. So you're looking for X. For what level of production will the profit be $1,000? What's the $1,000 on my little graph here? That's my profit, right? So the Y value is 1,000. Find X. Which one of these is the Y value is 1,000? Find X. C. C. Check. So now we have eliminated C and D, so it's multiple choice now for the other two. Everybody in agreement? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to part B. At what level of production, so what am I looking for? Level of production, an X. Will the marginal profit, what does that tell you? Derivative, derivative of profit. Uh, the marginal profit, the derivative B, $1,000. So we're looking for X when the derivative is 1,000. Which one of these says B, B. B? For what value of A for which the derivative is 1,000? It's fun when we do it together, isn't it? I know. No, you can't. <laughs> C. What is the marginal profit? So you're going to be looking for derivative. From producing 1,000 units of goods, 1,000 units is your X. I'm looking for the derivative when X is 1,000. Where is that one? There it is, A. Compute the derivative when X is 1,000. Everybody see it? Good. All right, anything in 1,7 bothering anybody? All right, let's go back to 1,6. We're working backwards. Okay, I'm on page 109. Oh, no. This is where your rules for derivatives. You cannot succeed on a test or the course without being able to differentiate. I'm on page 109, section 1.6. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. We just did 1.7. We're now in section 1.6. One the first rule said that when you had a constant like 3 times a function, when you have to take the derivative, it will be the constant, like 3, times the derivative of the function. Like when you had y equals 7x squared, it's 7 times the derivative of the x squared. Okay? What, and rule 2, what does that tell you? Somebody tell me, what does rule 2 tell us? Take the derivative of 1 and take the derivative of the other one and add them together. Exactly. If you have two functions added together, or 3, or 4, or 5, uh, it could be a plus or what else? One more thing. Minus. minus. Can it be times? No. Nope. nope. Can it be division? No. Nope. Only pluses or minuses. All right, so you just take the derivative really term by term, function by function. Like if you had 3x plus 7. The derivative of 3x is 3, the derivative of 7 is 0. Okay, question uh, part 3 on the top of page uh, 110. Very important general power rule. I tried to get you to use words. This is when you no longer have the variable x, although, you know, you really could use this. Don't let me forget to do this if it is a variable x. Okay? Don't let me forget. All right, this is when you have some function raised to a power. Let's use words to say what you do to take the derivative. Um, R. Bring the R down. <laughs> Rewrite exactly. Everybody say it. Rewrite. 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 
Exactly. Decrease, Decrease by one. one, and what are you not going to forget? Multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay, so let's look at a problem they did for somewhere in here. General, okay, here we go. Um, page 112, example three. This is good practice for your test. Write down the example with the instructions. Pay attention to the instructions. I've had students on tests say, well, if I knew what the instructions were, I could have worked the problem. Well, that's why you pay attention when you're working problems to what the instructions say. Differentiate means find the derivative. So write that problem down, then you work it. Well, anyway, here it is written down because they give you good detailed solutions here. You had to make it look like a function raised to a power, so they rewrote it to a half power. And you remember that you're going to be in bad shape on your test if you don't know how to go from radicals to fractional exponents and positive and negative exponents. I think I've made that fairly clear several times, right? Okay, so now you have your function raised to a power, so you just apply the rule. Bring the one half down, rewrite exactly, decrease by one, and they put in the other step to remind you, don't forget to take the derivative of the inside and then they just came down here and did it for you. Negative exponent, sent it down in the denominator. And, and personally, I don't care if you stop at the um, part where you leave the one half in the denominator or you go to the square root, either one of those. Okay? Uh, yes. Oh, you were just stretching. No, I have problems getting from that section. Like that. This one? Yes. You mean you have algebra problems, yeah. not calculus problems. Exactly. Well, what's one half times? It's all multiplication, okay. right? So one half times negative two is negative one, and then this one goes down in the denominator. Um, let me just write this out. Since it's all multiplication, you could, at this step right here, write one half times one over one minus x squared to the one half times minus 2x, and you could put that over 1. So if you just wanted to break it down as each little part multiplied together, and then when you multiply, you know, you just connect the dot to the line. Can't do that for adding and subtracting, right? But for multiplication, you can. And so now the 2 over the 2 cancels out, and here you are. Is that helpful to you? You're welcome. Okay, everybody's good? All right, now, what you were going to remind me to say was if you have y equals x to the 10th, I can still use the general power rule. So if you learn the general power rule, life is great. If you take the derivative using the general power rule, when you bring your 10 down in front, rewrite exactly, decrease by 1, and what's the derivative of the inside? 1. one. So your general power rule always works. General power rule always works. Okay? Can't miss it. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's look at page 116, the exercises. And I've picked out several. Um, let me just ask you, number 30. I got a marker on my hand, don't I? Number 30, don't let that be a distraction. Oh, it's on the other side, too. Okay. <laughs> Somebody give me a glove. All right, number 30. <laughs> How would you rewrite this so that you could take the derivative? Yes, 2x plus 5 all raised to the negative, negative one. 1 power. Very good, very good. Let me see if I see anything hard in here. Hmm, don't. Oh, how, what's the derivative of number 36? Yeah, it does not. Two pi. Two pi. Plus one. Zero. Two pi one. Two pi. It's pi squared. What would be the derivative of seven x? Seven. Seven. What's pi squared? Pi squared. Just a number, right? Uh, Three point one four squared. So it's about nine or ten. Ten something. So it's like ten times x. All right. Pi squared is just a number constant. So the derivative of pi squared x is pi squared. Pi squared. Pi squared. Okay, watch out for things like that. Are you looking at me like you don't believe me? 
<laughs> you okay? <laughs> you told me if you gave you if I gave you something like y equals 10x. Don't you tell me the derivative is 10? Yeah. Oops. All right. Well, what's pi squared on the calculator? Let's make a believer it's just out a of it. Yeah, it's just we a just number. It as a variable. Right. X is the variable. All right. So we got pi, and I'm going to square it. Where's that little square thing on here? Right here. Pi squared is about 9.8696. So really, we're looking at 9.86960444, whatever, x. So when you take the derivative, you're just left with the constant part, right? Because pi squared is a number. It's not a variable. Got it? All right, that was a trick. Watch for those on test. Okay, um, I saw one more that I wanted to ask. Well, look at number 27. What's that derivative? Three. Three. Why did you not say three pi squared? That's not a variable. That is a number. Yes, you finally got it. Okay, next question I need you to do is number 44. Great for test questions, right? Find the equation of the tangent line to this curve at x equal to 2. Okay, and I probably need to put somebody's work up so that if you made a mistake, we correct it here. Let me see some work. Yeah, that. Oh. Where'd you get your four five? Rise. Oh, right. So now write the equation of your tangent line. I need to get somebody though who doesn't have it right so we all learn from it. I think I hope I'm doing this right. I feel like you're gonna have it right. I need to get somebody who's not right. Where's yours? <laughs> no scribbling. You know, if you take really good notes, then when you're studying for your test, they mean something. But if you scribble all over the place, your notes are meaningless. And don't forget, I'm the one who makes out the test, so I'm probably the one who tells you what you need to know. Make your notes count for something. Okay, let's see how this one looks. What do you need to find the equation of a tangent line anyway? Slope. A slope and what else? Point, point, a point. point. All right, here's some work right here. All right, and I don't know if it's correct or not. I just needed one. Okay, y equals 8. Let's make sure it's copied right. Yep. 8 over x squared plus x plus 2 at x equal to 2. Looks like the first thing to me was the point was found. Does everybody agree with the point? Yes. Okay. So now you need a point and now you need a slope. So in order to find the slope, you've got to find a derivative. Um, actually, this thing right here is not your derivative yet. Let's mark that off and call this f of x. 
you're rewriting it in the form so you can take the derivative, right? You wrote this as 8 times x squared plus x plus 2 to the negative 1. Now you're ready to take the, this is not a derivative, that's your original function. So now you're going to take your derivative, you brought your 8 down, you said times, you, got, you bring your negative 1, rewrite exactly, decrease by 1. Is this the derivative of the inside? No. no. There's, okay, the derivative x squared is 2x, but the derivative of x is 1. And the derivative of 2 is 0. Okay. All right, everybody good so far? Okay, and so I guess we'll need to work from here to, because let's clean up our derivative. That looks like minus 8 times 2x plus 1 over x squared plus x plus 2 squared when we go from here to here. Is that correct? Yes. Be careful about taking the derivative of the inside. You've got to double check every term there. Okay? It's good that I did yours because I had a little mistake. Now you make 100 on your test tomorrow. Yay. All right. All right. Now that gives me the formula for the slope in general. We want it in particular when x is 2. So we'll look at the derivative when x is 2. So we have minus 8 times 2 times 2 plus 1 over. 2 squared plus 2 plus 2 squared. 4 plus 1 is 5. 5 times negative 8 is what? Negative 40. And then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 64. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, and that probably reduces, but hey, let's don't knock ourselves out too much. And you set up the... Um, difference in y minus the y coordinate and now all we need to do is change that negative one half to a negative 40 over 64 times x minus the x coordinate. Okay? Yes? Why can't you just say um, rise over run with two points to get the slope? Like, Why can't you say? Opposed, like saying one or yeah one over two. Okay so you have the point two one and like uh, if you're okay, you're on some kind of crazy curve that's probably looking oh, like okay, this, and you're at the point never mind, I got two one. I know, but I want to keep going with it because other people want to do that too. <laughs> Wait, that's enough. Learn your lesson. All right. <laughs> no, I, I do. I appreciate you saying that because somebody else is thinking that. So, all right, say what you said again that you learned better as you were saying it. Okay, rise over run. I thought was going to be the slope or be the easy way to get the slope. And so you would start here and do what? Um, what was your rise over your run here? It was one half. And where did that come from? <laughs> the point. Oh, the point. Yeah, oh. Point oh. <laughs> oh, I don't want anybody to hear that. Nope, 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 nope. You have the <laughs> right. You don't you didn't know anything about the slope. The only thing you knew was the point on the curve. All right, I misunderstood you. I thought you were um, trying to go with her little slope there or something. Okay, okay. Everybody good? Yes, will you send that to the back? Thank you so much for letting me put yours up. All right, uh, next question I wanted us to look at, that was number 44. Number 54, let's see what 54 looks like. The tangent line to the curve, y equals 1 third x cubed minus 4x squared plus 18x plus 22 is parallel to this line at two points on the curve. Find the two points. Oh, wrong one. 54. Yes, 54. The tangent line to this curve has slope 2. 53, I'm not doing it because the answer is in the back of the book. The tangent line to this curve has slope 2 at two points on the curve. Find the two points. Number 54. Talk to your neighbor about it and go for it. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of positive things here that sound good to me. All 
All right, how are you translating that sentence? The tangent line has slope 2. Tangent line to this curve. The tangent line has slope 2. What are you going to say? The derivative is 2, right? The derivative is the slope of the tangent line to the curve. The slope of the tangent line is 2. The tangent line to this curve has slope 2. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. Now, what substitutions are you going to make? Where are you going to go from here? Find the derivative. You can just look at that and tell. What is it? Minus 34. Okay. And now we're going to set that equal to 2. And now what are you going to do? Solving quadratic equation. It's a quadratic equation. What needs to be on the right side? Zero. So we'll bring the two over. So we have 3x squared minus 12x minus 36. What's your next step in solving this? Well, if you add 2 to a negative 34, it would be a negative 32. Yeah, it's a 32. Oh, you're right. <laughs> maybe we should use calculators the whole test. <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't. All right, what's the next thing you need to do here? Finding fact right. Well, you could jump into the quadratic formula, but do you see something to make your life a little easier? Okay, it's an equation. You can apply the golden rule. Do to one side of the equation as you do unto the other. So couldn't you divide by 3 and make your numbers a little easier? So we get x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0. Is that right? Yes. And hopefully that factors, what, x minus 6, x plus 2. All right, so we have x equal to 6, x equal negative 2. Yes. Have I finished answering the question? No. Yeah, thank you. It said find the points. So you have to find a y value. So where do I put this 6 to find its y value? In the original equation. Thank you. Back into your original. We're stopping there because we've got lots to do today. So go back to the original where y is equal to x cubed minus 6x squared minus 34x minus 9. So you find your y back in your original, not into the derivative. Okay, next example that you're going to do is problem number 56. Number 56. The straight line is tangent to this parabola. Find b which is the y-intercept of the tangent line here. Okay, number 56. This line is tangent to the parabola. Find out where it crosses the y-axis. Yes? They vary. I, I could look at copies of old tests. That'll help. Okay. Problem page. His question was, how many questions are on the test? I don't know. It covers the co it covers the content. I I really don't even know. Yeah. Okay. Problem number fifty six. Talk to your neighbor and go for it. Oh, you need your work. Oh, your calculator. Okay, it has more than one thing you need to do here, obviously, to solve. Let's hear some things that you're thinking that we need to do. Find the derivative. And why would you find the derivative? Get your slope. That What's will give me the slope of, the tangent, of tangent line. Tangent. Then what are you going to do? Substitute zero. 
you're going to find y where? When x is when zero. When x okay, so you're going to find the point, right? Okay, so finding the slope of the tangent line and this point six something on the tangent line, what's that going to allow me to do? If I have a point and a slope, that's going to give me, okay, that'll give me an equation of the tangent line because this point that you're looking for, 0B, is on the tangent line, so don't I need an equation of a tangent line? And then once I have the equation of the tangent line, it's going to be easy to solve for B, correct? All right, so let's do like we always did. Let's start with our point first. This tangent line touches the curve at 6, so let's get our Y value. So y is 1 half times 36 minus 4 times 6 plus 10. Half of 36 is what? Uh, 18 minus 24 plus 10. Um, what's that, 4? That, that wouldn't be negative up here. All I've done is found the point where these curves intersect. 6 is on the curve y equals 1 half x squared minus 4x. Can y'all see that? You might need to focus a little better. Or is it just me that can't see? Can you shift the paper over some so I can zoom in on it a little bit more? Shift the paper? Yeah, more towards the center, yeah. Okay, but the graph is what we can't see. Okay, we're good. All right, so now we know this point right here is 6, 4, 6, 4. And now let's get the slope of the, right? <laughs> when x is 6, we know the y value is 4. All right, let's get the slope of the curve at this point. So we're going to find the derivative. And everybody tell me what the derivative is. X minus x 4. Minus 4. <coughs> That is the formula for the slope of the curve anywhere, but I want it particularly at 6. So I'm going to evaluate at x equal to 6. So the slope here is 6 minus 4 or 2. All right. So now I can write the equation for the tangent line because I have a point and a slope. Point and a slope. And the unknown is on the tangent line. So we're in good shape. All right, so now we're going to write the equation of the tangent line. It's the point 6, 4. Slope is 2. So y minus 4 equals slope times x minus 6. And I'm just get, that's a good equation, but I'm going to get y on the side by itself. That will be 2x minus 12 plus 4, or y equals 2x minus you can write in any form you want that's correct I just am happy 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 when you get it correct all right but anybody know why I jumped on this form for this particular problem I want the y intercept and I knew if I got it in slope intercept form I could read right off what the y intercept was and there's the answer to my b Right? If you let x be 0, y is negative 8. Okay? Good. All right, there was one person who had a question from the homework from, um, what was the title? Homework 4. This is homework 4 in WebAssign. And what we want to do is look at what the person did and see if they, we can find the mistakes. So it's Question A and D. So let me go to the work. All right, so we learn from each other's mistakes. Here's problem A. 3x to the fourth plus 1 over 7x squared plus 1. All right, I want you to help me edit this first line right here. Help me edit it. Where's the first mistake you see? It's not a derivative yet. She hasn't taken a derivative. She's just rewriting the function. So it is not a derivative until you apply the rules. Okay? All right. 
Now, is 1 over 7x squared 7x to the negative 2? No. It is 1 seventh times 1 over x squared. And if you're using your 1 over 7x squared is like 1 over 7 times 1 over x squared. So if you're using your properties of exponents, that's going to be 1 seventh x to the negative 2. So here's where that mistake was, right there. Now, if you were, what you gave me here was really 7 times 1 over x squared or 7 over x squared, correct? If your problem had been um, 1 over 7x quantity squared, then that would have been 7x to the negative 2 like that. Is that good? Great. All right, that's a common mistake, so I appreciate that you showed it to me. All right, be careful, everybody. Got it? All right, the next question was with problem number 4, a D, problem D on there. All right, somebody help me edit this first line right away. You haven't taken a derivative yet. You're just rewriting it with a fractional exponent. All right, so what rule is she using for finding the derivative? What's it called? General power, General power, General power rule. rule. All right, the 1 half was brought down. We rewrote, decreased by 1, derivative of the inside. Does anybody see a mistake here? What's the mistake? Negative. Negative. It's a negative <coughs> 4. Negative 4, and then the next part, uh, whoa, yeah. You brought the 2 down, rewrote. Okay, so that would give you a negative 8x right here. And then half of negative 8 would have been negative 4. And then you would have gotten a check. Okay? All right, be careful with those negative signs right there. Thank you for asking and for showing your work so that we can learn from it because probably half the people made that same mistake. Didn't you? So you got friends out there. All right. Any other questions from 1-6? All right, let's go to 1-5. 1-5 was when we uh, were discussing differentiability and continuity. How do you look at a picture and tell if something's continuous? You don't have to ever pick up your pencil. All right, but that was not the limit definition of continuity. There were three steps for the limit definition of continuity. If something is continuous at a point, what is the first thing that has to be true? There has to be a point. There's got to be a y value, right? If it's going to be continuous at a point, you've got to have an x and y value. So you've got to have a point. And it's the limit definition of continuity, limit definition. So what's the next thing you got to do? The Take the limit. limit of your function as x approaches that x value. All right. And then, so you have a point, you have a limit. Now what has to be true about those two things? They have to be the same. Be the same then it's continuous at that point. All right. What does this word differentiability mean? Differentiability. It's a long word. What does it mean? It does the derivative exist? Right. Okay. In order for a function to have a chance to be differentiable at a point, what must first be true? Be it must be continuous there. So if it's not continuous at that point, then you don't even need to go any further because being a derivative means a unique tangent line can be drawn there. Unique tangent line. The examples on the bottom of page 103 show you where you can't get a unique tangent line. If you're coming in from the left side, the tangent line would fly off this way, coming in this way, goes that way. It's continuous, but it's not differentiable. Um, little corner points. This one is in the corner down here is not differentiable because the tangent line is vertical, and a vertical line has no slope. And so if you can't have a slope, then you can't have a derivative. All right, flipping the pages, let's see. Um, well, that was pretty much it. 
Here was your limit definition of continuity on page 106. We looked at that yesterday. You have to have your point, you have to have your limit, and those two things have to match. All right, we did some problems on page 108 yesterday. We looked at these, and we worked two of those, and that's about it in that section. What uh, can I answer from it? Because I feel like we did that one pretty good right from the exercises. Anybody question? Okay, one section 1.4. One point four was where you were introduced to limits and the limit definition of the derivative. One point four. Okay. Limits just means that as x approaches your function, as x approaches, what does the y value get very close to? So you're getting real close. It means approach not equal to. So when you're looking for a limit, you get real close to the number, and then you see if the y value is getting really close to it. So the limit coming in from the left has to be the same as the limit coming in from the right in order for the limit to exist. So you kind of think of a magnet coming in on x, then does the y values collapse to the same number? All right, and that's what your limit is. When you evaluate limits, I gave you the little McCollum simple cookbook, three things are going to happen. You plug your number in to the function, like here's example three right here. Don't forget to use your book. You just plug it in. You get a number answer. Is that your limit? Yeah, if you just plug it in and you got an answer, it just means that your y value and your limit are the same, you know, if you just plug it in. All right, so you plug it in. You get a number, that's your limit. What's the next thing that might happen? Plug it in and you get 0 over 0. What's that form called? Indeterminate. Indeterminate. What does it mean you need to do? Simplify. Simplify. And you might simplify by factoring or rationalizing the numerator or You might have a compound fraction. We saw those yesterday or the day before. In this class, those are the only three situations you're going to see for 0 over 0. Okay, in this class. 0 over 0, you need to either simplify by factoring, rationalize in a numerator if it's got radicals in it, or simplify in a compound fraction. Okay, limits. Um, Oh, okay, that, so you get you plug in and you get a number, you're happy. You plug in, you get 0 over 0, you go through the simplification. What's the third case that might happen when you plug and chug? Number over 0. A number other than 0 over 0 means you've got a vertical asymptote there. So when you're approaching that vertical asymptote, what's all the things that could happen? They could fly off to positive infinity on both sides, so your best answer is positive infinity. You're approaching that vertical asymptote, they could go down to negative infinity on both sides. That's a good answer. What about if you're approaching and one goes up and one goes down? What do you say? Does not exist. Does not exist. Okay? What happens when you see a problem like this? The limit as x approaches 3 from the left of 1 over x minus 3. What, what is happening when I give you what is called a one-sided limit? I'm looking from the left side of 3. I'm, I'm plugging in a number a little bit smaller than 3 because we already know 1 over 3 minus 3 is 0. 1 over 0, so my answer is either going to be positive infinity or negative infinity. So what number is a little bit smaller than 3? 2.9. 2.9. So if I put a 2.9 in for x, is this expression positive or negative? Negative. Negative. So what is my limit here? Negative. Negative infinity. So when you see a little plus or minus sign there, it's called a one-sided limit, and I'm wanting to know the direction that it's going. Okay? All right. What is the limit definition of the derivative? Tell me. 
Limit definition of the derivative. F of x plus h minus f of x all of h. Is that it, everybody? Yes. What? Thank you. Something very important got left out here. It's the limit as h goes to zero. Remember, this part is just the uh, slope of the secant line, two points on the curve. But when we bring those two little points as close as they could be, you're letting the distance between those two points go to zero. Raise your hand if you're going to leave this part off and lose points on your test. I'll probably forget it. <laughs> All right, will you write it down and sleep on it tonight? And keep, put it against your head or something, I don't know. You got to remember a limit, I mean a derivative. Well, first of all, listen to the instructions. The limit definition of the derivative, that ought to be a little help. Limit definition of the derivative. Maybe that'll help you remember it. Okay, so let's go to the exercises and see if I've left anything out. Okay, I'm on page 101, section um, 1.4. We looked at all these pictures that day and talked about if the function was, if the limit existed. Now, remind you again, in problem number two, at limit means gets very close to three. And as you come real close to three, the y value gets real close to two. The limit exists, but why did the point not exist? No dot there for it, right? If I had a little dot up here somewhere, I would get that y value, but the point didn't exist. Is this function continuous? No, no because it doesn't have a point. If there's not a point there, it can't be continuous, can it? All right. What about in problem one? Is it continuous? Continuous. I'm on continuous now. No, it's not, but it had a point, didn't it? What made it not continuous? The limit did not exist as you approach 3, because as you approach 3 from the left, it went to negative infinity. As it approached 3 from the right, it went to 2. In order for the limit to exist, it's got to go to the same place. Yes? Can you do a problem where it's like the limit approaches infinity and then to whatever? Where the limit approaches infinity? So like limit. I, okay. The limit is? X to infinity. Oh, X goes to infinity. Okay. Well, whatever it would be. And then after that. I just want to see what, go over one again. Okay. So the limit is x goes to infinity of something like 3x? Yeah, yeah just whatever. All right, what do you think? Infinity. If you put, try to put in a huge number, 3 times 100, 3 times 1,000. Is it either going to be when they go into infinity, it's either be positive or negative? Well, in this case, if you don't see a little plus there, that's understood to be positive infinity. If you have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 3x, this would be like 3 times negative 1,000, 3 times negative a million. So is it, it is it ever going to be an answer? Do it, do it like where it's 1 over infinity. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, is there ever going to be an answer where it's like not infinity as your? Yeah, all right, here. All right, as x goes to infinity, 1 over a very huge number goes where? 1 over 100, 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million. Gets closer and closer to zero. Gets closer and closer to zero. Is that what you're asking yeah. me? Um, what about this? Limit as x approaches negative infinity of 1 over 3x plus 2. 1 over negative 100, negative 1,000th, negative 1 millionth. That's still close to zero. Okay. Uh, what about this one? You're going to be sorry you ask, aren't you? <laughs> What's happening here, everybody? You guys are good because you know when x is getting to be a real huge number, this little 1 is very pitiful, this little 2 is very pitiful, it pretty much becomes 7x squared over 3x squared, which reduces to 7 thirds. Okay. that get your questions? Yeah. Everybody you. good? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any questions from 1-4? I don't remember seeing anything. We've um, practiced a lot of evaluating limits. Be sure you can do all the problems we did in class. Plus, again, your book has some great examples already worked out for you. Um, 
when you see on the test, I'm on page 102, when you see on the test, my instructions usually say use the limit definition to compute the derivative. What kind of credit are you going to get if you give me an answer like for number, where's an easy one? Okay, well, number 37. If you just go derivative equals 3, what kind of credit am I going to give you for that? None, because what am I looking for? I'm looking for that nice little limit definition that you guys are not going to forget to put the limit as h goes to 0 in. Okay, limit definition. What's the directions on the test say? Use the limit definition of the derivative to find. If the problem just says find the derivative, then you just use the rules. There's only one ever on a test that says use the limit definition. You don't have time to do a lot. So just look for that one problem, get it correct. Okay? All right, any questions from anybody in section 1.4? Here's a few more examples with your x's going to infinity. Don't forget your odd problems answers in the back of your book. Okay, everybody good with 1.4? Whew. Okay, 1.3. 1.3 will probably look pretty simple now, won't it? Let's just go to the exercises on page 89. These were, you were just using the power rule. I guess the only thing that I would have concerns about maybe is number 10. What's that derivative? Zero. Zero. How would you rewrite number 6? X to the negative 1 half and then take your derivative. 1 over X to the 1 half. So to take the derivative, uh, you need to write it as X to the negative 1 half and then take your derivative. Is that a positive look? Yeah. I <laughs> How would you rewrite number 16 before you took the derivative? X to the 1 fifth. X to the 1 fifth. And then take your derivative. How do you rewrite number 14 to take the derivative? X to the negative 1 seventh. How do you rewrite number 12 before you take the derivative? X to the fifth. Well, that's about it. Okay, um, what's the difference in number 32 between those questions? One says f at 16, one says f prime at 16. Put 16 in for the first one. Yeah, the what is 16 to the two thirds? <laughs> what did I say, two thirds? Sorry, three halves. What is 16 to the three halves? Don't put it in your calculator. <laughs> what is 16 to the 3 halves power? No, you can't. What, what are you going to do to solve this? Square root of 16 and cubic. What's the square root of 16? And 4 cubed is? 64. 4 times 4 times 4. Okay, then the f prime of 16, what does that mean you're going to do? Find the derivative and then put your 16 in. Okay? I think we're pretty good on those, don't you think? All right, 1, 2. 1, 2 is easy. That is just talking about tangent lines to curves. All right, let's go to difference equations. Agree? Yeah. So All right. When you have shown me mistakes you've made, it's because when you read, you don't put it on a time diagram so that you're translating correctly. Remember, you have your y sub 0. You have your n, and n is a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Your t is in terms of years. So N might be months, quarters, whatever. T is in terms of years. You're looking to see if you're wherever the equal deposits, payments, or whatever is being made. So when you do your t uh, difference equation, you're describing what is happening every period that's the same. So you'll have y sub n plus 1 is whatever you start out with, y sub n, plus what happens. 
What happens from Wasabin to Wasabin plus one? Most of the problems we had, there were some interest going on. And then there was usually a payment, which would be minus, or a deposit, which would be plus. If you start saving money at the end of every quarter, and you don't open any money, put any money in your account to begin with, Y sub zero would be zero. If you have money in your account, and you're pulling money out in order to clean it all out at the end, wherever you happen to be, you'd like that to be zero, right? If you're paying off a car, or home, your last deposit after your last payment should be down to zero. So you have to read carefully to figure out what all these values are. If you take out a loan, is your Y sub zero how much you take for the loan or is it zero? No, if you if you go to the bank today and bar okay, this is time, so this is today, starting right here, today. So if you go and borrow money today, then Y sub zero is whatever you borrow. And then you would be making payments so you, when you set up your difference equation, you'd go minus whatever that payment is because you're going to be reducing your loan. Okay, if you are, uh, and if you got your loan for four years and you were making monthly payments, when you get down here four times 12, 48, thank you. After you pay, if you got a four-year loan and you made monthly payments, your final should be down here at zero. Okay, and what would be the other situation? Um, when you are saving for the future, if you're saving, you might start out with nothing and make deposits of 100 at the end of every period, whatever that is. So then you'd have plus your deposit instead of minus. You gotta think about, am I reducing my balance with my payments or withdrawals or am I adding to my balance? Does that somewhat help? All right, this was the difference equation. The general form is A y sub n plus B. That's the general form, and remember you can iterate terms from that. You can also sketch a graph to discuss what the long-term behavior is. That was section 10.3, just from this piece of information. There was a little cookbook. If you were going to graph it, remember the first little dotted line you put in there was B over 1 minus A. And if A is greater than zero, what do you know about your curve? Monotonic, meaning always increase or decrease. And if your A is negative, you know it is oscillating. If A is bigger than one, what's it gonna do? Repel the line. And if A is between negative one and one, it's going to be attracted to it. And so you can sort of do a sketch of your graph to talk about the long-term behavior. Um, what is the formula for the solution to your difference equation? You guys are good. On your test, on your test, I have told you to keep four decimal places. Four decimal places. WebAssign, because it has one equation for the uh, answer, I mean, it had to be coded with one equation. So nothing is rounded in WebAssign unless they actually say in the problem round to four decimal places. But the coding had to do one equation to solve it. So nothing is rounded. So if you're off on your WebAssigns, it's because you didn't keep all those places in there. But on the test, I'll just tell you to go four. Yes? WebAssigns at night? No. <laughs> okay. Slave. All right. I, want, I do want to show you on um, WebAssign. Can we go to the um, WebAssign screen? Um, when you click in on your class, these assignments are now past due that were due today. And if you don't scroll down to the bottom, you're not going to know where your past assignments are. Do you see them right there, past assignments? All right, now I'm going to click on the past assignments, and I got zeros because I didn't do it. But I want to um, show you this. This says, very important, you won't get an extension if you go beyond this. Well, you don't need to contact me because you're not getting an extension. So we're going to view the key now. All right, but what I wanted to tell you is there should be, oh, I got the ones that somebody else made up. Let me back out of here. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm lost. Okay, here we go. Go to a homework problem that I did. Homework, homework. 
It should have videos of me in here working it for you. Should be. View key now if they set it up like they were supposed to. Okay, here we go. Solutions available for problems 1A, 3A, 3B. Alrighty. So click here to view the solution to this equation. Click here. Up. Oh, all right. That's because this is not set up apparently for that. Let's try another one. Yeah, technology is good. Click here. Okay, here we go. Open, I guess. I'll have to, if, if you click on something and it's not working, send a message to WebAssign right away and they should tell you. Okay, you should hear me any second now. Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, hopefully your computer has it. This is a university computer here. They're not going to let you do it. I tried on your computer. Any place you're on campus should work, or at your home, it should have it. But if you click here, you will hear me work the problem for you in detail. So if you missed a question, this is a good place to go back. That's one of the reasons your homeworks were due now, the day before the test, so you can go back and hear them. All right. Um, glad I've demonstrated that on screen. Okay. Anyway, there's... Hey. Don't think we want some music. All right. Anybody got a specific question for me? Um, what about those ones where it's uh, like this? Gary is just retired and has $750,000 in his retirement account. Okay. So what, what did you not understand about the question? Um, how to find the uh, amount for each of the 25 years. So it'll, Are we looking it'll at number be, six? Yeah. All right. Let's look at your work. Cool. Um, What's your y sub zero? Where's your work? I don't see it. Uh, it's, it's not mine. <laughs> I was just... Okay. Y sub zero, wouldn't it be the uh, 750,000 since yep. that's the start? There's your y sub zero. And then uh, your B will be, in B what you're solving for? Um, the amount you would withdraw for yep. each month was 25. So you'll be looking for your B. That's right. And then... Uh, and would be okay if this one got missed on WebAssign, it's probably due to rounding. You want to keep all your uh, numbers in there till the end. On the test, I'll let you stop at four, but I'm sure it was due to rounding. Okay, so basically, you're just going to be solving for uh, B. Right, you're going to be solving for B. Okay, and then problem number six continues and I want to show you that it says what's the maximum amount that can withdraw each month if he wants his savings to last indefinitely how's that problem different than the previous one excuse me didn't say the exact period didn't say the exact period so what are you going to be looking for you need a constant function don't you if his money's going to last forever Right, we need the um, amount to equal B over 1 minus A. The other thing you can think about is he's got 750000 and it's going to earn interest for one month. So isn't what he's going to pull off, if you're going to go indefinitely, and he's just going to pull off that interest right there, so he'd be back to 750000 So another way you can think about that is just figure out the interest. 750 What's the rate? 0.08? And what's the time interval here? 112? Doesn't that make sense? If you want your money to go on forever and ever and ever, never end, you just got your money, earn some interest. This is like scholarship money. Find your interest, give it away, you're back to 750000 Go to another month, give away the interest or take it, you're back to seven fifty. So it will last forever for your kids to fight over. Everybody good? Whatever that is, yeah. So <laughs> dumb. <laughs> okay, you should be able on your computer, this is locked because the administrator here, be able to get me videos working some of these problems for you. No, okay. you need to find like initial values, you just solve for y sub zero. If it says how much should you initially deposit or how much can I borrow to do this, you're looking for y sub zero. Okay, anything else? All right, make good mathematical statements on your test. Show all your work.
If you don't show work, we can't guess where it's coming from if you miss it. All right? Can you do it? Yes. Make it a great day, everybody. Okay, we're going to quickly come back and finish up Lecture 7B. What happened at the end of Lecture 7 was that I was trying to show you how to get to WebAssign past due assignments with the video links, and there were some technical difficulties with, um, the, pro with the process. So I'm just going to quickly go over here to your WebAssign. I'm going in as a student, um, taking Math 131, and you will notice that uh, all the assignments for test one are now not showing up here. They are past due. Some students don't realize that you scroll down to the bottom and you can get your past due assignments. So we'll click on the past due assignments and you'll see I didn't do any homework. I got scores of zeros all over the place. And I want to scroll down to one that I know for sure I have videos in. Your homework one, which I scored a zero on, past due. I'm going to click on this, and you will notice the answers will now show up for you. So when you have your work, you can go back and see what the real answer is, how close you were, try to find your mistakes or whatever. And some of the problems, selected ones, will have the solutions worked out. And so I'm going to click here to view the solution. I want to open it. And no thanks, I'm not ready to update because we're just trying to illustrate this. The problem states that a person deposits $500 at the end of each quarter, that would be one fourth year, one half year, three fourths year, one year. They deposit 500 at the end of each quarter in an account earning 6% compounded quarterly. The question is, how much is in the account at the end of 20 years? 20 years, 4 times a year, N will be equal to 20 times 4 or 80. So we will be interested in how much is in the account at the end of 80 deposits or 80 interest conversion periods. Notice that the account starts out with no money. The deposits are made at the end of each quarter. You'll recall that we define the difference equation to state what happens from one general period to the next. So the difference equation, in general, will be y sub n plus 1 equals. We begin with y sub n. Okay, I'm just going to stop it right there because I wanted you to know there are lots of problems that I have worked out for you in detail that you can go back and see me watch. Another thing that you may want to do is to remember when you get ready to study for your final exam, this is a good way to come back and just have a refresher on how to work the problems. Okay, uh, sorry that didn't work in 7A, but we've got it all cleared up now, so enjoy and make it a great day.